In this lesson, we'll talk about zero-factor property and its application in solving polynomial equations. This property states that if we multiply two quantities and the product is zero, then either the first quantity or the second quantity is really zero. Perhaps for the first time in this course, we may try to prove this property, prove this statement. How the proof may go? Well, we may consider two cases. What if a is zero? Well, if a is zero, then the conclusion is true because one of those statements is already true. So that's not a problem. Okay, therefore, what if a is not zero? Then, since the assumption a times b is equal to zero and a is not zero, we can actually divide this equation side by side by a. Let's do it. So, on the left hand side, we can cancel the a, leaving just single b, and the right hand side, zero times anything is still zero. So, we have our conclusion, therefore, b is zero, and our statement is proven. Great! Why this property is so important? Well, we basically use it nearly every single time when we solve polynomial equations. We are going to factor a polynomial on one side, equal it to zero, and then claim that one of those factors must be equal to zero. Let's see. Say we want to solve this equation. Since we have a polynomial on one side and zero on the other side, the idea is to factor this polynomial into two linear factors, equal it to zero, and then claim by zero factor property that at least one of those brackets must be equal to zero. So let's factor. We start with x and x in each bracket. We are looking for two numbers that multiply to 40 and that differ by 3. So that will be 8 and 5. The larger number takes the middle sign, so it's negative 8 and positive 5. OK, now we are going to use the zero factor property, stating that either x minus 8 is equal to 0 or x plus 5 is equal to 0. So we ended up with linear equations, which we know how to solve. We just bring the 8 to the other side and we have x equals 8 or x equals negative 5. Therefore, the solution set consists of 8 and negative 5. We can state it underneath. The solution set of this question is negative 5 and 8. Let's look back for a second at our solution. With time, you will be fluent enough to see solutions directly from this equation, just by looking at those factor brackets. As you see, the solution is the number that you see in a bracket, but with opposite sign. Just because when we solve this linear equation, we move the negative 8 to the other side, and the sign changes into opposite. So we don't actually need to write this line we can read at once from the equation that the solution that comes from this bracket is 8 and the solution that comes from that bracket is negative 5. OK, let's see the second equation. Again, we need to factor the left-hand side. So let's take x as a common factor out. What's inside is 3x plus 2 equals 0. And again, using zero-factor property, we can claim that x is equal to 0 or 3x plus 2 is equal to 0. Well, this time let's write it down. 3x plus 2 equals 0. And then this equation is already solved. There's nothing to do here. But this linear equation we need to solve. So we bring the 2 to the other side. 3x equals negative 2. And finally divide by 3 so x becomes negative 2 thirds. Therefore, our solution set is negative 2 thirds and 0. Notice that if you would like to read the solution directly from this bracket, we would take opposite to the last free term, negative 2, but then we are dividing by the leading coefficient. That's why we have negative 2 thirds. Obviously, at first, it's OK to write down this linear equation, just step by step solve it, but hopefully with time you can read those final solutions directly from the bracket. Since when solving polynomial equations, the idea is to use zero-factor property, 
we must have zero on one of the sides of the equation. So in example C, this 28 must be moved to the left hand side. Okay, therefore we need to multiply this bracket through 12y squared minus 5y and then subtract 28. Everything is equal to zero. Only then we are able to use zero product property. So now we need to factor this polynomial. Since the outside terms are composite, let's use the composition method. So we are going to list the product. The product is negative 12 times 28. Okay, but instead of multiplying these two numbers, let's factor them. So we have negative and 12 is 2 times 2 times 3, and 28 is 2 times 2 times 7. That may help us to group those factors in such a way that the product in each group differs by 5, because our sum, which is actually a difference, is negative 5. So the numbers that we are searching for are, hmm, if we group 3 and 7, that gives us 21, and the other four twos will give us 16, 16 differs from 21 by 5. And since 5 is on negative side, we need to use negative 21 and positive 16 as our numbers to decompose the middle term. So the negative 5y can be written as negative 21y and plus 16y. Copy the rest. Negative 28 and 12y squared. Everything equals to 0. Now we are going to group 2 by 2 and factor each group. The common factor in the first group is 3y. What's left is 4y minus 7. And the common factor in the second group is 4. So plus 4. And then we have 4y minus 7 equals 0. Finally, let's factor this common bracket. 4y minus 7 times 3y plus 4 equals 0. And then see if we can read directly the roots from each bracket. So the solution for this bracket will be y equals opposite sign to the last number, which is 7, and divide by the leading coefficient, which is 4. So we have 7 quarters. Or y could be equal to opposite sign to the last free number, negative 4, and divide by the leading coefficient 3. So both 7 quarters and negative 4 thirds satisfy the original equation. Therefore, those are our solutions. Let's see example D. Again, remember, we must keep 0 on one side of the equation. So we're going to bring the 27 to the left. 3x squared minus 27 equals 0. And then let's factor. We can factor the 3 out, leaving us with x squared minus 9. But that's something that we can recognize. That's a difference of squares. So let's factor again into two brackets, x minus 3 and x plus 3 equals to 0. So now we see three factors, number 3, this first bracket, and the second bracket. Obviously, the constant term 3 will never be 0, so this doesn't produce any roots. But from this bracket, we have a root x equals 3, or from that bracket, we have a root x equals negative 3. Therefore, those are the two possible solutions to this equation. Okay, let's look at the next example. This time we have fourth degree polynomial, quite a complicated one, with four terms. But the right hand side is zero, so we are in a good position for factoring. Let's check the very first step of factoring. Do we have common factor? Well, yes, we do. All the numerical coefficients are divisible by 3, and also x repeats itself as well. So we can pull out 3x. And then inside the bracket we have x cubed plus 5x squared minus 4x and minus 20. Okay, equals 0. That's not the end of factoring because we still have this third degree polynomial to factor. Since we deal with four terms, maybe grouping will help. Let's try to group 2 by 2, and I would suggest to take this minus outside of the bracket as well. So let's see what we have. 3x, I'm going to write a square bracket, 
instead of this round one. And then from the first two terms, let's take common factor x squared, leaving us with x plus 5 inside. From the last two terms, let's take negative 4 out, leaving x plus 5 again, which is great, equals to 0. Now we're going to factor this common bracket x plus 5, so we have 3x, x plus 5, and what's left is x squared minus 4, but this is still something that we can factor, it's a difference of squares, right? So let's factor again, 3x, x plus 5, and then it's x minus 2 and x plus 2. A lot of factors. Each factor, as long as it's not constant, will produce one zero. So from here we know that x could be zero. From this bracket we know that x could be negative 5. That bracket gives us the possibility of 2, and this one gives us the root negative 2. Okay, therefore the solution set for this equation is, and we can list all four solutions. If we write in order, that will be negative 5, negative 2, 0, and 2. All those four numbers are solutions to the above equation. And the last example, we have algebraic expressions on both sides of the equation. The idea is to put everything to the left and make it equal to zero. In the meantime, let's square this bracket using perfect square formula. So we're going to square the first term, which is 4x squared, minus double the product. The product is 6. When we double, we have 12x, plus last term squared, which is 9. Then rewrite the plus 18 and bring this whole expression from the right to the left. So that becomes plus 9 times the bracket. So when we open the bracket will be plus 18x and minus 27 equals 0. You may want to double check those signs on your own. Okay, let's collect like terms. So we have 4x squared and put together the linear terms 18 minus 12 is plus 6x. Finally, 18 plus 9 is 27 minus 27. That really cancels. So we actually don't have the free term. We have just this equals to 0. Okay, let's factor it further. We can take common factor 2x out of the bracket, and in the bracket we have 2x plus 3. Here we go. Therefore, our solutions are either 0 because of this factor, or this bracket gives us opposite sign to the free number divided by leading coefficient. So it's negative 3 halves. Okay, so that's our solution set. It's not that we have to write every single time the solution set. We can leave the answer either this way or that way. That's fine. So you've seen how to solve different type of equations, even the more difficult ones. Now it's time to practice some questions from the textbook.